Welcome back to chapter 20. This is going to be part two. So now that we have discussed um, what the lymphatic system does, the use of the lymphatic capillaries, collecting vessels, um, ducts and trunks, and we've talked a little bit about lymph is, we've also explored the different organs that make up the lymphatic vessels and discussed the fact that the primary ones are going to be the thymus and the red bone marrow for our T cells and our B cells. And then we have lots of secondary lymphatic organs. So I say we just continue our conversation, taking a look at the organs. And why not start off with the one that will actually filter out the lymph fluid and thereby alert our immune system. That's right, let's take a look at our lymph nodes. All right, so keep in mind that for the lymph nodes, you want to remember two main important things. The first thing you want to remember is that it's an example of a secondary lymphoid organ. And then the second item that you want to remember is that it will be the only location where the lymph fluid can actively get filtered. Now, you will have lymph nodes all throughout the system. Most of them are going to be relatively deep in the connective tissue, but then you have a few that are very close to the body surface that can easily be palpated. So here on your PowerPoint, it says the ones that are close to the system or to the body surface are going to be located in the inguinal region, which is your inner thigh region, the axillary region, which is by the armpits, and the cervical region, which is by the neck. Let's take a look at that on the picture. All right, so here's the lymphatic system again, and now we're going to concentrate on the lymph nodes, which are going to look like little kidney beans all over the system. Notice how they're distributed all over, but then they went ahead and on the right-hand side, they label the ones that are the closest to the skin, cervical nodes, axillary nodes, and inguinal nodes. Um, if you've ever been to the doctor, like maybe you weren't feeling well, or even sometimes when you go in for just a regular annual, you might notice that the doctor will take their hand and kind of feel on your neck region, or they might even put it on your, in their, on, between your armpit, and they'll kind of press down. Well, when they're doing that, they're palpating the lymph nodes. They want to see if they hardened. Usually, if there's an active pathogen that's being trapped in the filtration system of the lymph nodes, the lymph nodes will start to harden. And that's one of the telltale signs that your immune system is actively trying to fight something off. The two main functions of the lymph nodes should come as no surprise to anyone. Obviously, it's going to be filtering the lymph. And as it's doing so, what we're looking for are any type of unwanted substances or foreign entities. Um, and we could see that when they are detected, you can you rely on things like your macrophages that will start removing it. And in case it requires a higher degree of action, in case there is a larger viral load, then that is then when the rest of your immune cells, like your T cells and your B cells will become activated. And in fact, the activation is part of its second function. So right over here it says the second purpose of your lymph nodes, it's immune system activation, and that is because it will allow the lymphocytes to become activated and mount their defense. And once again, it can activate it because it's able to filter the lymph to detect any abnormalities. Now take a look at what it actually looks like. Lymph nodes are relatively small. They're about an inch. For those of us with the metric system, that's around 2.5 centimeters. They really do look like a little kidney bean. And as you can see on the bottom picture, they went ahead and they showed you how the cervical cluster of the lymph nodes tends to be distributed. Each of us will have a slightly different distribution, but either way you'll have that cluster that runs very close to your neck surface. Um, lymph nodes will have a connective tissue capsule that will surround its outer layer. Um, that is then why it's so easy to kind of separate from the rest of the tissues and the organs. We also see that it has what we call trabecula, which are these little fibers that will extend inwards and create different compartments. Um, and in fact, what we see happening is that from a histology point of view, it becomes very clear when we do our staining techniques that the lymph nodes have an outer section called the cortex and then a middle section called the medulla. And each of them will have a slightly different function, especially when we take a look at the T cells and the B cells. 
So within the cortex, once again, this is going to be the outer layer, what we see happening is that you have what we call a superficial and a deep cortex section. The superficial area, so the one that's closest to the surface, that one's going to be mostly occupied by B cells, whereas the deep cortex will have mostly T cells that are kind of sitting there and waiting and transit. And the T cells will just be housed there until they're called over, so they'll be able to jump back into the lymphatic circulation as well as the blood vessels and circulate over to their site of injury. Um, because you have so many T cells and B cells there, it is also important to note that you have an antigen presenting cell there, and that antigen presenting cell, which we like to abbreviate as APC, is going to be your dendritic cell. Now, what exactly is an antigen presenting cell? Well, you're going to see that term appear quite a bit in the next chapter. So I don't want to go into all the details right now, but basically it does everything that the name indicates. An antigen presenting cell is able to detect a foreign antigen and it will take a piece of that antigen and it will present it to the T cells and the B cells and thereby allowing the T and the B cells to become aware of this foreign invader and figure out exactly how it's going to combat it and fight it off. So there are a handful of different antigen presenting cells. So the first one you'll get to meet is the dendritic cell. Remember the dendritic cells, the example of it was the Langerhan cells. It will basically penetrate through the tissues such as the skin and it will look for anything that's foreign that doesn't belong there. And when it finds it, it will go ahead and take a little piece of that pathogen and it will bring it over to activate the T cells and the B cells. So within the cortex of the lymph nodes, I'm going to have my B cells, my T cells, and my dendritic cells. The medulla of the lymph nodes is going to have a little inward extension of the medullary cords that originate in the cortex. And collectively over there, you will be able to find B cells, T cells, as well as some plasma cells. Now, I should also notice or note to you that within the lymph node structure, if you take a look at the cortex and the medulla region, you're going to come across lymph sinuses. These are going to be large openings that you find throughout the entire structure. And the reason the sinuses are so important is because this is where the lymphatic capillaries are going to be emptying out the lymph fluid so that they can actively start filtering the lymph and see if there's any abnormalities. Now, very similar to when we talked about the reticular fibers in our previous section, you're going to notice that there's lots of reticular fibers that will be intertwined within the sinuses, and these are going to also be used as a scaffolding process so we can take cells like our macrophages and we can allow them to come in direct contact if there's any type of pathogen that's being detected. So here's a nice illustration of your lymph nodes. Notice how they went ahead and they highlighted for you the cortex section where you're going to have your little lymphoid follicles, the germinal centers where the B cells like to hang out, and then you have your medulla section. The medulla section is the middle section right here where we're going to have our T cells, our B cells, and our plasma cells full of sinuses all over the place. And then notice these extensions that are coming from the lymph nodes. We have our afferent and efferent lymphatic vessels. So that's how the lymph fluid enters, and this is how it exits. Notice the addition of the valves to allow for one-way flow. Oh, one last thing to point out. Notice the capsule. Remember that's that connective tissue layer? That will surround the lymph node that's why it's classified as an organ and then the trabecula are the fibers that i was mentioning to you before that will allow you to create different sections within the lymph nodes including sections within the cortex and the medulla another secondary lymphatic organ is going to be the spleen now the spleen is mentioned in a lot of different chapters because it has many different functions one of the functions is obviously its ability to contribute to the lymphatic system, and the way it does so is because it has these areas called white pulp that will house large amounts of different white blood cells. 
So it's kind of like a collecting pool of these immune cells until they're called over to their mechanism of action or their site of injury. Um, the spleen will also have lots of red blood cells. Some of you might remember that the spleen is called the red blood cell graveyard because there are a lot of older cells that lose their flexibility through the, lose, uh, the loss of spectrum will kind of pop open and then the red blood cell will die off right there. But we also see that the spleen will have collecting pools for the red blood cells. And this will be the red pulp. I will show this to you in a picture coming up about two slides from now. But either way on your slide, it says right here, it says the spleen is a blood rich organ. It is below the stomach on the left hand side, it kind of wraps around. It is the largest lymphatic organ based on mass. It has a splenic artery and vein, which is how the blood comes into it. Um, the spleen is also unique because it can filter blood. So your lymph nodes can filter lymph and your spleen can filter blood. And its functions include, it's a site for lymphocyte proliferation and immune surveillance and response. And that's gonna be within the white pulp where all the white blood cells are collected together. And then when it comes to red blood cells, it's gonna be able to cleanse the blood of it because of its small blood vessels, it will pop any old red blood cells. Also old platelets, and then it does have macrophages nearby that will come and uh, phagocytose the remainder of the cells. Here's a little picture of the spleen. Um, we can see our illustrated example with the splenic artery and vein coming in. And then over here at the bottom, we have one from a cadaver model. And you can see this is the little diaphragm. That is the dome-shaped muscle that separates the thoracic and abdominal cavity. And as you can see, it's in close uh, uh, contact with the spleen since it wraps around from the left side. And it's just a little bit below the stomach. It kind of peeks out from underneath the stomach. Some additional functions of the spleen, it can store breakdown products of red blood cells, so the iron for later reuse. Um, we talked about that in our previous chapter. It can also store blood platelets and monocytes, which are your little white blood cells, and for hemostasis, um, the uh, clotting of the blood. Um, it, in a fetal stage, so when you're still developing inside of your mother's stomach, your spleen will actually have an erythrocyte production role meaning that it's able to generate red blood cells. Um, after birth, the spleen will halt with this function um, because your bone marrow will be able to maintain everything. And as I said to you before, there are these different areas within the spleen that you can easily identify when you do a histology slide. And these are gonna be stained differently. You're gonna have your white pulp and your red pulp. And the name comes from the type of cells that are being actively housed and stored within those particular sections. So here is a little diagram. I'm gonna show you the red pulp and the white pulp from a histology standpoint in just a second. But as you can see right here, they've drawn it out for you. The red pulp gets its name because it houses lots and lots of red blood cells, so erythrocytes, and that will generate a reddish hue. The white pulp gets its name because there are lots of white blood cells that are hanging out within these cavities, waiting to be activated and moved over depending on what the immune system says. Um, the white pulp gets its name because through the staining process, it usually will stain a lot lighter, and we know that that will correspond with the presence of different white blood cells that are being housed there. And then notice lots and lots of blood vessels because as I mentioned to you before, the spleen is unique in its ability to filter blood. Here it is from a histology standpoint. So those of us who are currently in lab, we probably have to study this particular slide. And as you can see, looking at the spleen, there are separated sections. And these separated sections that are slightly lighter on the inside, so here's the lighter part, those are going to be categorized as the white pulp. So that's where you're gonna have your little white blood cells hanging out waiting to become activated. The rest of the cells that are on the outside, those are all gonna be part of the red pulp. And that is where you're gonna have your red blood cells. 
that are being housed and located. Okay, and it tells you right here, it says the white pulp is a lymphoid tissue with many lymphocytes, so white blood cells, and it's surrounded by red pulp because of the fact it has lots of erythrocytes, which are our red blood cells. Next one to take a look at is called MALT, M-A-L-T, mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. This tissue is usually embedded within the mucous membrane. Um, you'll have some that will come in direct contact with orifices, openings to the external part of our um, environment, but also some that will come into direct contact with different lumens. So for instance, we can take a look at our tonsils, we can take a look at our Peyer's patches, as well as the appendix. All three of those would kind of fall in, would fall into the MALP category. So let's start off with our tonsils. So the tonsils come in many different variations. They are named based on the location that they're in. And in a little bit, I'm gonna switch views and show you a picture where the specific ones are located. But for now, I want us to take a look at the insert of the histology picture. And you can see that from an anatomical standpoint, the tonsils have lots of tonsillar crypt, which are these like white spaces that allow them to create germinal centers. And these germinal centers just means that they're small little cavities or small little sinuses that are filled with different white blood cells. And as a pathogen tries to enter your body, either through the nasal cavity or through the oral cavity, when it enters, it will fall into these little germinal centers and it will get wrapped around by mucus as well as potentially phagocytose. So it really is an example of um, almost like a, a very an innate line of defense, meaning all of us are born with the tonsils and all of us have this protective feature from them of being able to trap the pathogen within their little crepts and germinal centers. Now let's go back to the names and we can take a look at our top picture. You can see that they've labeled for us the palatine tonsils. These are probably the ones that most of us are very familiar with. These are the largest of the tonsil. They're towards the back of the oral cavity. Um, next time you're in front of a mirror, open your mouth real wide, and you're going to notice that on both sides of the ovula, which is that dangling part that you see in the back of your throat, you're going to see two little masses kind of stick out. Those are your palatine tonsils. These are also the ones that most commonly get infected, um, and if you've ever had a tonsillectomy, meaning that you've removed your tonsils, chances are that you've had your palatine tonsils removed. Some people have a chronic issue with the tonsils, that they'll have massive inflammation, and this can actually inhibit your airflow, especially when you're sleeping, and also especially if you're a little bit on the heavier side. The next one is your lingual tonsil. This one is located towards the base of the tongue. Then you have your pharyngeal tonsils, which goes over to the pharynx region. Um, the pharyngeal tonsils actually are more, most commonly referred to as your adenoids. And these are located more towards the back of the throat. So here you go, you see them labeled right over there. And then last but not least, you have your tubal tonsils. They get their name because they tend to be around the auditory tube in the pharynx. Let's see if the other picture will pop up for me. Here we go, perfect. So here we have an open mouth and you see what they've done for you is here's my little euphala. And then you can see the tonsils that are peeking out on both ends. These are the palatine tonsils. The lingual tonsils are more towards the back of the um, tongue. The adenoin or the pharyngeal tonsils, that, that tonsil, excuse me, um, is located towards the posterior wall by the nasal pharynx, so it's a little bit higher up the back of the throat region. And then the tubial tonsils are the ones that are associated with the location of the auditory tubes. Look at them. And regardless of the name and the location, keep in mind that all of them will have a very similar histology point with the crypts and the germinating centers. Here we go. 
The next malt to explore are going to be our Pyres patches. And I've mentioned these to you before. Um, they are found in the ileum, which is the end part of the small intestines. And from a, an anatomy standpoint, they're very similar in that they have these little sinuses, these little dips, that very similar to the tonsils are going to be filled with white blood cells. And their whole purpose is to obviously destroy any type of pathogen, primarily bacteria that might have made his way into the digestive system and is still actively trying to wreak habit. And also what we see happening is that it can generate what we call memory lymphocytes. And memory lymphocytes simply just means that it's keeping track of the pathogen it has been exposed to. So in the future, it will go ahead and have its mechanism of action ready to go and you'll have a much quicker response. Another, or this is the last malt to be discussed, is your appendix. So your appendix basically dangles off your large intestines. Um, it's usually right by the cecum, which is kind of the joining point between the ileum and part of the small intestine and the cecum, which is the starting point of the large intestine. Um, for many years, people would say, well, your appendix, you don't really need it. It's what we call a vestigial structure. It's there, but it doesn't really contribute anything. Well, a lot of research now has shown that, yes, you can live without your appendix, but it turns out that it does have very distinctive functions. And one of those is the fact that it can actually house an extra surplus of the bacteria flora that you require for your digestive system to work perfectly. In addition to housing some extra bacteria in there, it also has the ability to figure out if you have a pathogenic exposure to bacteria, so bacteria that can cause you harm, and it can actively destroy this bacteria by using the white blood cells that are in the, in the, located in the appendix and therefore protecting your body from it spreading further. We also know that very similar to the Pyres patches, it has been shown to be able to generate memory lymphocytes, which as I mentioned before, is very essential to you developing immunity. The next organ to discuss is going to be our primary. It's going to be a primary lymphatic organ and that is going to be the thymus. Now the thymus, um, some unique features about it is that it undergoes what we call involution, meaning that it actually shrinks as we get older or as your PowerPoints will say, it atrophies. When you're born, it is massive. And then toward, as we go into the continuation of our childhood, into adulthood, we see that it starts to slowly shrink down. And by the time you become um, a senior citizen, or even by the time, unfortunately, if you live a rich life and you die, into your late 80s and 90s, hopefully we all make it that far. If they do an autopsy, they won't even be able to find the thymus because at that old age, it has shrunken down so much that it just looks like a little bit of adipose tissue that you find towards um, the inferior part of the neck. Um, it wraps itself around the trachea. It's located very near to the heart. And like I said, it starts off really large and then it shrinks as we get older. Now, your thymus is a primary lymphatic organ because it will, be, it will be the site where your T cells become immune, and that basically means they become immunocompetent. Immunocompetent means that they learn the difference between a self-antigen and a foreign antigen. So that is then when they'll be able to be actively involved in your immune system. Here is a picture of size comparison for the thymus in a child. So here's a newborn. You can see it's massive. It's overlapping the heart. It's wrapping itself around the trachea. And then as we look at the adult mom, notice how it has shriveled down considerably. And part of the reason why it needs to be so large as an adult is because we're literally born with a blank slate, uh, a blank immune system, and we obviously have to start building up a tolerance for the world around us. So an enlarged thymus will help us activate T cells at a quicker rate, making them more effective as they become immunocompetent.
And these T cells are able to generate a memory. So as we become adults, the thymus can afford to shrivel down into a smaller size. It still will maintain its function, just not as effectively, but that's okay because as an adult, we have been exposed, by that time we've been exposed to different pathogens. So hopefully we have built up quite a library of different immune cells that will protect us from our outside as well as our inside environment. We will talk lots more about the thymus when we get into our next chapter because then we're really going to focus on what goes into making a T cell immunocompetent and what type of selection process is required to make sure that the T cells can definitely distinguish between a foreign cell and a cell cell because we don't want it to destroy our normal, healthy, everyday cells. Now, within the thymus, we do see that it's broken down into different sections, different lobules. You will have, very similar to the lymph nodes, we'll have a cortex section and a medulla section towards the middle. Um, the cortex is best known for the fact that it will have some macrophages as well as some rapidly divided um, lymphocytes in it. Um, the medulla will have more of the regulatory T cells in there. Now, for some of you, that might mean nothing right now, but regulatory T cells is a special type of T cell that will help us regulate the response of the immune system so that it makes it um, less likely for your T cells to attack your own healthy cells because that could potentially lead to you developing an autoimmune disease, which we definitely don't want to have. And then one thing that I definitely have to say for the thymus is that there are some clear differences between its setup versus the other lymphatic organ. We've already mentioned some of the differences, right? So we talked about the fact that the thymus is a primary lymphatic organ because it will help activate, make um, immunocompetent the T cells. Another difference is that it has no follicles because it lacks B cells. It does not directly fight antigens, and part of that is because it's too busy making T cells immunocompetent. And in order to do that, it will have a blood thymus barrier, and the blood thymus barrier is going to be essential for harboring our immature T cells, so the cells that don't know the difference between self and foreign yet, to keep them isolated from any of your other regular cells, as well as pathogens, while they're actively being trained on how to become immunocompetent. So that blood thymus barrier is essential for training or making your T cells immunocompetent. We also see that it will have a network of fibers. It will have a stroma that will assist with housing the different white blood cells. But please note, and this is number three on your PowerPoint, the stroma is going to be made of epithelial cells not reticular fibers. So we're going to have a different composition of the stroma, and part of that is because it turns out it all has to do with training those T cells effectively. We don't want them adversely to be exposed to any type of connective tissue cell or antigen cell that might potentially cause them to have a cross reaction. Um, Remember, the whole goal of your T cells is to produce, I'm sorry, of your thymus, is to produce immunocompetent T cells. So that blood thymus barrier is extremely essential in its entire training process. But there will be more details to follow on that if we go into our next chapter. As you can see, chapter 20 is nice and short. It is um, a really good introduction to the lymphatic system. So please make sure that you review your notes. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, you know, please to email me. Um, and then in our next chapter, we're going to take the knowledge that we've obtained from here. And we're going to go into more detail because we're going to take a look at exactly how do we make our T cells and B cells what goes in into making them immunocompetent? And then the fun part about the chapter is how exactly do they help us fight off pathogens? So what are their mechanisms of actions? So lots of fun and lots of details to come in our next chapter. So we shall, quote unquote, talk soon. Enjoy the rest of your day.